What do you know about amphibious tanks? Maybe you picture massive combat vehicles struggling to cross water obstacles. Or perhaps you think they are nothing more than impractical toys. Maybe you assume that amphibious tanks were just clumsy early 20th century experiments to combine a boat and a tank. But what if I told you there's a tank that moves through water just as confidently as it does on land? Meet the PT-76, a unique Soviet amphibious tank that saw action in conflicts across the world, from Vietnam to the Middle East. It may not be as famous as the legendary T-55 or KV series tanks, but that makes its story even more intriguing. Why was this tank so popular? What set it apart from its counterparts? And why didn't the West develop a true competitor? Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like. It's a small action for you, but a huge help for the channel. Let's dive in. In the pre-war years, the Soviet Union accumulated significant experience in the development of amphibious tanks. However, with the outbreak of World War II, work in this area, along with the production of already designed models, was halted as designers focused on more urgent priorities. By 1941, the Red Army possessed the largest fleet of amphibious tanks in the world, but the vast majority of them were lost in the early months of the war. One of the main reasons for this was that almost all Soviet amphibious tanks were lightly armored and poorly armed, making them ineffective against the better protected and more powerful Wehrmacht tanks. After the turning point in the war and the beginning of the Soviet offensive in 1943, the Red Army was left with only a small number of outdated and unreliable vehicles whose combat capabilities no longer met battlefield requirements. Furthermore, in 1944 to 1945, Soviet forces faced an urgent need for bridging equipment to cross numerous water obstacles during their advance through Eastern Europe. However, the Army lacked self-propelled bridging vehicles, and the remaining pre-war amphibious tanks were unsuitable for this role due to their limited buoyancy, which prevented them from carrying additional loads. As a result, until the arrival of pontoon bridges, which often struggled to keep pace with the advancing forces, Red Army soldiers had to rely on makeshift crossing methods that were not capable of transporting heavy weaponry. This significantly slowed the advance and led to increased casualties. After the war, the absence of amphibious vehicles in the Soviet Army remained a significant issue. In the event of a potential conflict with the West, Central Europe was considered the primary theater of operations, and its numerous water obstacles would have posed serious challenges for Soviet forces. As a result, by the late 1940s, several models of amphibious vehicles and transporters were adopted into service. However, the development of amphibious armored vehicles was far less successful. Immediately after the war, a technical specification was issued for the creation of an amphibious tank and armored personnel carrier, with a high degree of unification. The tank was to be armed with a 76mm gun and, in addition, be capable of transporting 20 troops on its armor while afloat. Between 1946 and 1948, the Krasnoye Sormovo plant developed the R-39 tank, which was structurally similar to pre-war amphibious tanks. However, its weak armor, insufficient reliability, low speed on water, and inadequate buoyancy, as revealed during testing, ultimately led to the project's cancellation. In 1949, the development of a new amphibious tank was assigned to two design teams from scientific research institutes. Simultaneously, work was underway on a unified amphibious tank and armored personnel carrier, which would later become the BTR-50. According to the technical specifications. The tank was to have a mass of 13 to 14 tons, be armed with a 76 mm gun with 40 rounds of ammunition, feature armor up to 10 mm thick, and reach speeds of 40 km per hour on land and 10 km per hour on water. By the end of 1950, the design bureau was required to present a prototype for testing. Various propulsion options for movement on water were considered, but ultimately, a water jet propulsion system was chosen. The chief designer of the tank was N.F. Shashmuran. However, the water jet system faced opposition, leading to the initiation of an alternative design at a Moscow plant, which used propellers similar to earlier amphibious models. Despite these debates, 
the project progressed successfully, addressing many of the shortcomings of previous designs. By the spring of 1950, prototype tanks and armored personnel carriers were completed and sent for state trials in June. At the same time, the Moscow plant finished its own designs, the K-90 tank and the K-78 armored personnel carrier. Comparative tests between the BTR-50 and K-90 were conducted from July 5th to July 29th, 1950. The BTR-50 demonstrated significantly better cross-country mobility than the K-90. The Evaluation Committee also noted that in several aspects, including armor thickness, ground pressure, land speed, and operational range, the new tank even exceeded the original technical requirements. The new amphibious tank was designated the PT-76. On August 6, 1951, it was officially adopted into service by the Soviet Army. Mass production of the tanks began in 1952 at the Volgograd tractor plant and continued for 15 years. During this period, a total of 3,039 units were produced. The technical characteristics of the PT-76 are not particularly impressive, but it is important to remember that it is an amphibious tank which required engineers to make certain compromises. Nevertheless, the tank underwent multiple upgrades and improvements throughout its production cycle. For example, in 1952, an additional mechanical pump was introduced to facilitate water drainage. Another modification involved improvements to the design of the wave deflector shield. Starting in 1955, the tank was equipped with a new gun featuring a dual-chamber muzzle brake. Barrel clearing was handled by an ejector system. Additionally, a coaxial machine gun was installed. The heating system was improved, and the ammunition loadout was expanded to include armor piercing and heat, high explosive anti tank rounds. Most modifications focused on increasing crew comfort and improving protection and observation systems. When integrating new types of weaponry, engineers also prioritized crew safety during operation. The most significant upgrades to the PT 76 were introduced after the 1960s. It was fitted with more modern armament, which required corresponding adjustments to other aspects of the vehicle's design. The PT-76 is powered by a V6 diesel engine, which, despite its designation, is not a V-type engine. In this case, the letter V in the name does not indicate a V-shaped configuration, but rather signifies that the engine was derived from the V2 family of Soviet tank engines. Instead, it is a straight six, inline six, cylinder engine. The light amphibious PT-76 tanks were widely exported to Warsaw Pact countries, as well as pro-Soviet nations in Africa and Southeast Asia. In some cases, they underwent modifications. Israeli engineers upgraded captured Egyptian PT-76 tanks, while China developed its own version under the designation Type 63. The PT-76 was widely used in various armed conflicts around the world. It saw action in the Vietnam War, as well as in the Arab-Israeli conflicts of 1967 and 1973, where it was deployed by Syrian and Egyptian forces. The tank also played a role in the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971, the Yugoslav Wars, 1991-1995, and was occasionally used during the Chechen War. Despite its relatively light armor, the PT-76 remained valuable due to its amphibious capabilities and effectiveness in terrain with numerous water obstacles. By the spring of 1965, tensions along the India-Pakistan border escalated, with Pakistani forces launching frequent attacks. Fearing a full-scale invasion, India turned to the Soviet Union for support and received its first PT-76 tanks in August 1965. At the start of the war, India had around 90 PT-76, organized into two regiments. Since the tank was unfamiliar to Indian troops, they nicknamed it Patton, after the American tanks they had encountered before. Notably, the PT-76 was the only Soviet tank used in the conflict. Battle for Tati Jaimal Singh On September 21st, Company C of the 7th Regiment, equipped with PT-76, launched a counterattack on the Pakistani-held village of Tati Jaimal Singh. 
the battle results. Pakistani forces were driven out of the village. Indian PT-76 destroyed one M-48 Patton and one M-4 Sherman. Captured war trophies. Two jeeps with 106mm M-40 recoilless guns. Two trucks loaded with ammunition. The Pakistanis managed to destroy one Indian PT-76. Final losses. India lost about a company of PT-76 mostly abandoned by their crews. Six or seven tanks were captured by Pakistani forces. The first battle between Vietnamese tanks and Americans took place on March 3, 1969. Twelve PT-76 from the 202nd Tank Regiment attacked the Ben Het camp, aiming to destroy a battery of 175mm M107 self-propelled guns. However, they were met by M48 Patton tanks and M42 Duster S-Bags. As a result, two PT-76 and one BTR-50 were lost, and the attack failed. Americans called the PT-76 the ghost tank, largely due to the ineffectiveness of their M-72 law rocket launchers, which often failed to penetrate its armor. For example, during the battle at Lang Ve, some tanks were hit up to nine times but were still operational. In 1971, during Operation Lam Sun 619, North Vietnamese forces deployed 22 PT-76, while South Vietnam claimed to have destroyed 26, a clear overstatement. In one battle, four PT-76 stormed Hill 543, capturing up to 60 prisoners, including the commander of the 3rd Airborne Brigade. One PT-76 even shot down an F-4 Phantom with its anti-aircraft machine gun. During the Easter Offensive in 1972, the North used 56 PT-76, but most were lost. The last major battle took place in January 1973, near Kua Viet Port. The South attacked in two columns with 130 M-41 and M-48 tanks, plus M-113 APCs, but ran into an ambush. Although the North Vietnamese lost nearly all their vehicles, one PT-76, number 704, managed to destroy seven enemy tanks before being taken out. In 1973, both Egypt and Israel used PT-76 tanks. The Egyptians had 40 in the 130th Brigade, while Israel fielded seven in the 88th Battalion on the Sinai Front. On October 6, Egyptian PT-76 helped cross the Suez Canal, but when they tried to push toward the Mitla Pass, they ran into Israeli M-48s. The result? Heavy losses. 20 tanks on the first day, most of them PT-76. But on October 16th, Israeli PT-76 made a game-changing move. Seven tanks and eight BTR-50S crossed Great Bitter Lake, securing a beachhead near Abu Sultan. The next day, the 88th Battalion ambushed the Egyptian 25th Tank Brigade, but their 76mm shells couldn't penetrate T-62 armor. By October 19th, Israeli forces launched an all-out offensive. Moving fast, PT-76 struck air defense and radar sites, clearing the way for air support. But in the battle near Aorhi, all Israeli PT-76 were damaged, with one destroyed. The PT-76 was used in the Yugoslav Wars and during the Chechen War. In the Battle of Grozny, January 1995, the Russian 59th Special Purpose Regiment deployed nine PT-76 tanks. However, urban warfare was brutal for them. Their thin armor made them easy targets for RPGs and IEDs. That said, in Grozny's ruined streets, their light weight and high mobility allowed them to navigate areas where heavier T-72s couldn't go. But in Afghanistan, 1979-1989, PT-76 were never used. The main reason? No major rivers or water obstacles requiring amphibious tanks. Additionally, Afghanistan's mountainous terrain and long travel distances made the PIT-76 impractical. Its thin armor was vulnerable to Afghan RPGs, and its 76mm gun was too weak against fortified positions. 
Instead, the Soviets relied on T-55s and T-62s for firepower, while BMP-1s, BMP-2s, and BTR-70s handled mobile operations. The PT-76 has a mixed legacy. On one hand, it was perfect for reconnaissance and river crossings, thanks to its amphibious capability and lightweight. When introduced in the 1950s, it was one of the best light tanks of its time. But on the other hand, its thin armor and outdated weaponry made it vulnerable to modern anti-tank weapons. In the Soviet Union, the PT-76 was gradually replaced by the BMP-1 and BMP-2, which could also swim but had better firepower and protection. By the 1980s, it was removed from frontline units, staying only in reconnaissance and naval infantry. After the USSR collapsed, Russia retired the PT-76 by the early 2000s. Where is it still in service? Even though it's outdated, some countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America still use the PT-76. Indonesia. Modernized versions with new engines and guns. Vietnam. Still used for river and swamp patrols. India. North Korea. Cambodia still have PT-76s in their forces. In the end, the PT-76 was a success in its time, but is now obsolete. Its biggest impact was proving the concept of amphibious reconnaissance tanks, which later evolved into modern BMPs. There was no true Western counterpart to the PT-76. Some vehicles had similar roles, but their concepts and designs were quite different. Closest alternatives and competitors M551 Sheridan, USA, a light airborne tank with amphibious capabilities. It was armed with a powerful 152mm gun missile launcher, making it deadlier in combat. However, it was more complex, expensive, and less reliable. LVTP-5 and LVTP-7, USA, large tracked amphibious assault vehicles used by the U.S. Marine Corps. They could carry troops but had weak armament and were not designed for independent combat. AAV-7, USA. Another amphibious vehicle for the Marines, similar to the LVTP series, but with improved mobility. AMX-10P and AMX-10RC, France. Light combat vehicles with amphibious capabilities, but more like IFVs or wheeled tank destroyers than true light tanks. it could actually swim. Unlike the Sheridan, which technically had amphibious capabilities but struggled in practice, the PT-76 was built from the ground up as a floating tank. It was simple and reliable. Minimal complex systems, proven technology, and low production costs made it effective and widely used. Perfect for reconnaissance. Light, maneuverable, and able to cross rivers and swamps undetected it could appear where no one expected it. But it was weak in combat. Its 76mm gun was useful against light vehicles and fortifications, but was ineffective against main battle tanks. The Sheridan, on the other hand, could fire anti-tank guided missiles. Conclusion. Western armies saw no need for a floating tank concept. The US focused on either powerful airborne tanks or amphibious troop carriers for the Marines. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union invested heavily in light amphibious tanks for reconnaissance and rapid deployment. As a result, the PT-76 remained a unique vehicle with no real competitor. And that concludes the story of this unique tank. I hope you found the video interesting and informative. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about the tank and this video format? Do you like this style of presentation? That's it for now. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss future videos. See you soon.